Hello and welcome to Dogs with Torches. In this episode, we are joined with Dr. Brian Kempel to discuss medieval semiotics and the gradual development and reflection on the being and activity of signs in the Middle Ages, beginning with Augustine of Hippo and culminating with Jean Poinceau in the early modern period. Dr. Kempel received his doctorate in philosophy from the University of St. Thomas in Texas in 2016. He has written two monographs, Ens Primum Cognitum in Thomas Aquinas and the Tradition, and The Intersection of Semiotics and Phenomenology, Pierce and Heidegger in Dialogue, as well as an introduction to philosophical principles and linguistic signification, a classical and semiotic course in grammar and composition. He is the author of many articles, both scholarly and popular, and after teaching for several years at the college level, as well as privately consulting, Dr. Kempel founded the Lyceum Institute, where he currently serves as executive director. Dr. Kempel's work focuses on theories of knowledge, semiotics, and metaphysics. Dr. Kempel, thank you so much for coming on today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Hunter. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about semiotics. Yeah, me too. And I'm, I suppose that it might be a good idea before we dive right into uh, the history of, of semiotics is maybe to sort of help clarify terms and terminology, especially since to, to a certain extent, talking about medieval semiotics is a little bit is something of an anachronism, because that's not necessarily how they were characterizing uh, disciplines. John Poinceau didn't didn't necessarily write a treatise on semiotics, he wrote a treatise on signs. And we, right. we, we need to be careful about how we, we use the terminology. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, it, it ends up being a very confusing terminology. I mean, for, for anyone who doesn't know the real origin of the term in this this modern usage was actually proposed in uh, the late 17th century by John Locke, um, who at the very end of his essay concerning human understanding proposes uh, semiotic as as a sort of um, third branch on the, on the primary divisions of science um, to supplant logic, as it were, um, and sort of be a broader, more extended version of what logic has traditionally been. And then no one paid any attention to this proposal of Locke until a few hundred later when Charles Peirce picks it up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, certainly there's it's it's a little bit of a historical oddity. It's it's an interesting thing. Uh, but what's proposed by the term semiotic and what's proposed by John Ponceau and a doctrina signorum, a doctrine of signs, really are the the same thing, I think. Um, I'd also, and, and I know this is this is an interesting uh, sticking point, and it's a hard one to sell people on. I object as well to the term medieval um, because it's it's this modern prejudice which was foisted upon these these thinkers who certainly didn't think of themselves as a middle age between two glorious periods. Um, but yeah, and uh, it's, it's hard to shift the the <laughs> goalposts on that one. That's true. I mean, I guess this is like you know, uh, uh, periodization is is what are they? That they be what extrinsic denominations that that, that we made for ourselves. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, and those uh, who are intrinsic may not agree with those extrinsic denominations, but that's <laughs> yeah. that's fair. So another question that that we might ask is, uh, what exactly do we mean by signs? I mean, usually when we think of signs, we might think about what some would call conventional signs, like stop signs or driving indicators, or maybe even like language. Um, but but would medieval figures have understood signs and sign vehicles to have a greater scope than than merely cultural? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's just to to make a few points here. Um, it's really interesting, uh, this, this prominence of the conventional, I mean, really probably the first thing it comes to, I would expect almost all of your listeners minds when they hear the word sign is a stop sign, right? I mean, we get that from, you know, three years old in the car and it's bright and it's red. And so you pay attention to it and say, yeah, what's that? Stop sign, stop sign. Right. Um, and it tells us really something, though, about the, the world that we inhabit, that even outside of stop signs, we tend to think about, I don't know, open signs or exit signs or road signs in general, um, you know, just this this cultural uh, permeation of our existence. Um, I suppose, you know, and, and that's a point that we'll, we can turn back to maybe later in, in the discussion. Um, I suppose if you pressed some people, they might think of other things as well, uh, you know, depending upon their own education. If you read a lot of 
Homer, right? You might think of omens, right? Now those are signs, you know, here's the, the eagle flying and it's got a snake in its beak. What does that mean? What does that signify? Um, and then you might also get some people who think, okay, well, I don't know, maybe some Sherlock Holmes, some forensic analysis, detective work, um, animal tracking, things like that. Uh, but all of this is still a kind of confusion, right? That, that this isn't what we really signify by the word sign. We're confusing what today we often call the sign vehicle with the sign relation. And I always like to, to point out as an example that the stop sign, this most prevalent of signs in our own experience, in our own sort of you know ready store of what a sign is, signifies quite differently to us than it would if you'd dropped a stop sign in the middle of North Sentinel Island, which is home of one of the last isolated peoples on Earth. Um, I think the last person who tried to, to visit the people of North Sentinel Island from outside was a missionary who was promptly killed, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, he was a little over enthusiastic about uh, uh, his chances. Um, <clears throat> but if you put the stop sign on North Sentinel Island, uh, it'll signify something to them, but it sure won't signify the law that we understand it's to signify. Mm -hmm. And that relation between that vehicle, the stop sign and the law is what signification really consists in. It's what the actuality of signification consists in, that it represents to us this third thing, this law. And unless you have that actual triad, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, right? you don't really have a sign. And so, uh, yeah, just to, to pull to the other part of your question here about the, what, what the, the Latin thinkers would have understood um, if anything, for them, and this is, again, that curiosity of the, the prevalence of the cultural, if anything, for them, the cultural was secondary in terms of what signs were. They thought about it much more in terms of nature. And I think especially in, in you know, Latinate literate people, um, I mean, the word signum in scripture is almost always used with reference to the divine or the divine will or, or some sort of divine providence. Right. So, uh, you know, to the scholastic mind, especially you're talking about the um, supreme principle of nature, right. uh, the supreme creator. That's, you know, everything is, is a sign of God in some way. And so, yeah, right. if they're thinking about it, they're thinking about it through nature and what nature signifies and how nature signifies God. Um, the idea of, of cultural signs was certainly present but it was secondary and derivative in some way right i mean the theme of of, of created entities being signs of the divine i mean that, that's prevalent throughout the the scholastics you know all all, all the way through i mean i i, I would bonaventure I, I know that he talks about like vestiges or like footprints of the divine that you see in nature that signify a first principle and that that was primarily how they have considered like signs and and cultural questions about culture even though that that, that they were they, they they might have been a secondary concern to them they, they weren't it wasn't as fundamental um maybe as it is for our own mindset yeah and uh i mean we'll, we'll see this uh as well i think when we talk about augustine um you know the a, a lot of it the cultural signs, um, the instituted or given signs, they get a bunch of different names over the, the centuries. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it concerns learning, and a lot of that then gets into these debates between Aristotelian theories of learning and the soul and Platonic theories of learning and the soul. And so it's it becomes increasingly important uh, in this cultural sense and how human beings interact with one another in the world. Um, but you're you're still within this you know sense of a hierarchy of being uh in a way that's maybe not quite so prevalent in our own minds today so we really sort of have flipped things around in terms of of uh what's more prevalent and what's more prominent and then another distinction that is often made by the scholastics that is very interesting and maybe it's it's not necessarily exhaustive or admits of, of weird cases but th there was another distinction that, that that was made between ends rationis and ends 
reale or nature. How exactly, what is this distinction? Maybe a, a good follow-up is how best to translate these these words, because this was a sticking point that Delia raved about. Yeah, um, and it's, it's an interesting uh, point for, I don't know if this was mentioned in the introduction, I'm kind of spacing out for a second, but uh, for any of your listeners who don't know, I, I actually wrote my dissertation under John Dealey, um, who uh, was was sort of widely known in the semiotics community and as someone who really uh, discussed and bridged these gaps between semiotics and the you know modern, late modern sense, postmodern sense, and uh, medieval philosophy and scholasticism. Um, but it was, it was, uh, one day, um, John and I, we would often go to breakfast as our way of, uh, meeting for, for dissertation, uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, that was, that was his advisement time was over breakfast. Um, <clears throat> he'd always eat a Belgian waffle. Um, but we were driving back to campus one day and I pointed out to him that never once in his entire corpus does Thomas Aquinas use the phrase ens reale. Uh, not once and in, in all 8 million words will you find that phrase and uh, Dealey kind of paused and he said huh <laughs> and then you know we, we sort of went on about how the idea is present there um, interesting okay and, and it is but yes Aquinas uses the phrase ens nature a, a being of nature uh, being uh, uh, you know having its own internal principle of existence and I think that's the idea, which is quite generally conveyed by the notion of ens reale, which is a term that, um, you know, Dun Scotus uses the term ens reale. Um, I'm not sure how frequently, but you can find it um, even in, in the critical, you know, uh, Commissio uh, Scotista, uh, Scotistica um, versions, the Vatican Commission on, on the critical editions of Scotus. It's there. Um, uh, not, not very frequently, but in the few volumes that I've looked through, uh, I've, I've seen it a couple of times and it's also used by, uh, the probable author of the Summa de Totius Logicae Aristotelis, which is, um, uh, probably written by Grazia Deus de Ascolo, very little known early 14th century, uh, person somehow in the school of Thomism, very little is known about his life. Um, and his work was long thought to be that of St. Thomas, the, the Summa de Totius. Um, John Ponceau, for instance, frequently cites from it, which is a little bit problematic. Right. Right? Uh, he even defends at one point quite quite vociferously that this is certainly a work of St. Thomas. The authorship, oh. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, just the fact that he uses the term ens reale in there, and Aquinas never does in any of the authenticated works, shows you, okay, well, there's probably... Uh, good reason there alone to think that it isn't his. Um, so anyway, to get to the terms themselves, and I'm kind of rambling a bit here. Um, the ens rationis, um, you know, we could translate it quite literally, being of reason. And as long as we properly understand what's meant by by reason, it's not too problematic. But the term reason has been so overthrown in modernity that it is problematic and it is difficult. So Dealey would insist upon mind independent, or excuse me, mind dependent, or later on, actually very late in, in his life, he started using the phrase awareness dependent. I'm not a huge fan of that myself um, because I think it, uh, awareness is a little bit more, more contextualized and it's more in the moment. Um, I will sometimes use cognition um, because I don't even really, I mean, the term mind as well has all sorts Listed. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's got some baggage, right. Um, but the idea being that, that what is ens reale or ens nature has a principle of existence in itself, making it to be what it is. Whereas whatever is ens rationis ha doesn't have such a principle. Um, it, it's dependent upon some provenation from our mind or our cognition's activity in order that it exists in the way that it does. So hugely, immensely important terms for understanding signification, because an awful lot of signification occurs through either kind of these mm. sorts of beings, and right. very, very frequently, far more than we realize, a mingling of the two. Right. I mean, th as I understand it, that was a sort of debate in the background that the medievals would have is 
how best to understand the being and activity of signs, whether it's a holy mind dependent relation or whether or not it's it's a mind independent relation and, and there, there are also other categories we can probably think about like um that don't quite fit in the in uh, under either category like we can talk about like borders of a country or, or or something along those lines but like is that a mind dependent entity or mind independent entity well in one sense yes but in another sense you know no it's a, it's a question of like secundum quid like, like what exactly do, do you mean there yeah well i always like to use the example and i, I know you know we have listeners instead of viewers but I, i've got my mug here i know when i talk about what's my mug well it's a mug of itself but it's mine's dependently my mug right? mm. my that notion of possession there's nothing physically in the thing itself which makes it mine, right? Um, and so I think just one last point on this, and, and this is a very important point to emphasize, when we're making this distinction, it's much more about how the intelligible object exists rather than how the thing is in itself, right? And this is just one really final point here. There's a fascinating uh, uh, connection in terminology that Aquinas sometimes actually uses the phrases res rationis and res uh, naturae. And of course the word reale is derivative from the word res. Right. So that's there's, uh, yeah, well, he may, he contrasts to the terms uh, res and ends in a couple places, uh, most, most prominently in the sentences commentary and in the metaphysics commentary, um, and I, I take this up in an article that I wrote for the journal Reality on pages, um, it's in the, the print edition on pages 85 and 86. Um, in short, that, that the term res principally refers to the intelligible structure of a thing, and the term ends principally refers to the existence of it. Um, they, they often signify materially the same thing, but with a different formal focus. So it's a really interesting point, and there's a lot of uh, points to pull apart there. Um, but I think that the main focus, and I think it's really interesting when he uses res rationis and res uh, nature, um, you know, I think he may have used ends because that was a little bit more the convention of the time. But I think really the distinction is on the grounds of, of res, how it is an intelligible thing or an intelligible object, I should say. Well, that's very interesting because I, I always thought that that was a distinction that was often made between the thing and the object. I mean, and, and I guess we, we could maybe like discuss very briefly, you know, what exactly do we mean when we talk about objective in the context of, of semiotics? Um, and I was I always thought that thought that objective what, what, what was it was a different thing than than the concept thing, but 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 I, I, I could be misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, the, this is this is a whole episode unto itself, right? Um, because the word objective, uh, and I, I won't go on too long about this, right? Hmm. Our modern sense of the term is just completely bass backwards from what it meant for the, the scholastics. Um, the etymology of the word of ob and yectum uh, literally translated would be something more like what is thrown against, right? Um and so something is objective to the scholastic mind only insofar as it is in relation to some cognitive subject. So uh, on, on, if no one is looking at or thinking about or, or talking about the tree outside, it's not an object in any way. Right. Somebody has some living thing and especially some sensate thing has to be in relation to it somehow some cognitive agent has to be in relation to it to make it into an object. And so this is the the distinction between thing and object is really between subject and object in the, the classical scholastic sense. Um, the terminology of thing and object is used in, in the 20th and 21st centuries and scholasticism really comes from Maritain's uh, use of that verbiage. Um, and I, there might be others who are responsible for it, but I know Maritain really popularized it. Uh, he makes it a sticking point in in the degrees of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, what is a a thing in that sense, uh, or a subject or a substance? We might say uh, something in the order of substantiality. Again, is something that tracks along that notion of ens naturae. Right, it has a principle of existence in itself. 
whereas what is an object uh, is an object precisely by that relation. Not quite the same thing as an ens rationis, not quite the same thing as, as what exists from that, right. but what is the terminus of that cognitive relation is the object. So it could be a subject as well. The tree is a subject. It's there. It exists. I, I can guarantee it, even if nobody can see it other than myself right now. Um, but it's also an object when I see it. And it's an object, even for you in a way, when you think about a tree in the broadest, vaguest sense, even not knowing what kind of tree it is or what it looks like or anything uh, along those lines. You you know it's a tree. And so insofar as you know it is a tree, you are making it an object of some kind. That's very interesting because when you think about how the terminology is used from, I guess, the early modern period onward, usually when we use the term objective, we mean like, you know, from a, from a God's eye view or like independent of any opinion or thought even, or w what we're trying to, to, to get at, you know, you know, what's your objective opinion on, on the matter, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, impossible, right? We can't get a God's eye view of anything. It'd be nice if we could. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's completely opposite. Um, mm -hmm. and Dealey has a, a great discussion of this in, um, a book published in 2009 titled purely objective reality um even just the first you know 15 20 pages of that will, will give someone a, a great insight into how this terminology was all twisted around i see i figured maybe we can pivot a little bit to discussing um some of the early figures that discuss signs and what we would call today uh semiotics um and one of the figures that i figured we could discuss is that uh, augustine of hippo um augustine of hippo of course is is famous and foundational for western scholasticism and how they they approach questions of theology and even to a certain degree ph philosophical matters how exactly does augustine understand and define signs because this is a very famous question that he takes up i believe it's it's in his de doctrina christiana if i'm not mistaken where he discusses the sign but it's it, it's present in other works like on the teacher yeah um the de doctrina christiana is the sort of um, classical locus for his definition of sign and really he doesn't talk about what a sign is very much in that book um he's mostly talking about well christian doctrine christian teaching um <clears throat> Uh, so aside from, from the first couple of chapters in the first book and, and the first chapter in the second book, he doesn't have much theoretical discussion of what signs are. But in that book two, uh, chapter one, he defines a sign, and I'm going to give both the Latin and, and my English translation here. Uh, he defines the sign as <clears throat> signum est eum res preter specium quam ingerit sensibus adiot adequid exe faciens in cogitationem venire. So a sign is anything which beyond the specification which it brings into the senses makes something other than itself come into cognitive awareness. Well, there's quite a few things going on in that definition. Um, and I'd say the first and the most important part, the sticking point that will become a point of dispute for a good... 1250 years after him um is this point of bringing specification into the senses mm -hmm. that just has huge implications for what he's saying a sign is because if it's something that's bringing specification into the senses well that means it has to be something sensible right it has to be something which impresses itself on the senses so that means that it's always a physical something right that a sign has to be something which is out here that has to be perceived somehow in itself in order that we then move to this something other which is brought into our cognitive awareness so like a stop sign like a stop sign or or a word he talks a lot about words um as as signs but you have to hear a word or see a word written um, you have to encounter its physical presence um, somehow. And so um, when we're thinking about, uh, excuse me, um, what a sign is or how such signs occur, Augustine goes on to make a further distinction right, uh, between what he calls signa naturalia and signa data. 
signs of nature, natural signs, and given the signs, right? data, what is, what is given. Um, and so the signa naturalia, those were in fact really the um, conventional way of conceiving signs before Augustine, especially in Greek antiquity. Um, you read through most of the discussions of signs and you'll you know, here discussed in terms of things like medicine, uh, medicine, natural history, sort of forensic, you know, signification of, of events which have happened previously, and a very slight discussion mostly concerning interpretation and rhetoric of words as as signs. But even there, um, and we'll talk more certainly about uh, Aristotle's uh, peri hermeneas or de interpretatione mm -hmm. um, because this is a major point for later uh, scholastics but even there you know when aristotle talks about signs and and i don't think augustine knew this text but when he talks about words rather excuse me he talks about them as you know signs of thoughts or the question is are they signs of thoughts and are they a sort of natural sign right is it sort of right. like an, the semantic triangle an, yeah 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 is it like an onomatopoeic sort of thing that all of our our words are really naturally based upon some uh, you know internal um system of signification or something along those lines uh, a natural internal system of signification um mm -hmm. so uh, augustine's really innovating by uh, bringing forward this notion of of the given the sign that there's instituted signs that we somehow through our will bring signs into being um, and Dealey's always sort of made the point that uh, it doesn't even seem that Augustine was aware of how significant an innovation this would prove to be, mm. um, that he kind of just took it as obvious, it seems. And of course, we don't really know all of the intellectual culture of his time, uh, so much from from the you know late 4th, early 5th uh, centuries has been lost to history. Um, so we don't know really what he was reading or what he was encountering or what people were discussing at his time. And so maybe it was in the air, but uh, Augustine was certainly a genius. And so to credit him with this innovation is not outside the, the scope of what is reasonable, I think. Right. Yeah, and what's so interesting about this definition is that Augustine doesn't restrict signs, the being of signs, to merely cultural phenomenon, um, and that, that he thinks that there are such things as natural signs. But what would be examples of, like, natural signs? Would there be, like, signs of illnesses or signs of, I don't know, what would he, I mean, he wouldn't take omens to be, like, signs, I, I wouldn't think. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I think most of his treatment of natural signs is fairly customary. I don't think he he doesn't even really talk about natural signs that much. Um, he really is more interested, um, particularly in the context of, of um, sacraments, right? How sacraments are instituted signs, right? How Christ instituted these signs to, to lead us forward. Um, and also, and, and, and I mean, this is uh, the other major text in which he talks about signs the, on the teacher at the De Magistro. Um, there he's really talking mostly about how signs are involved in our learning and mm -hmm. how we try to give one another signs to uh, allow us to interpret natural signs. So there's there's a long, and the whole thing structured as a dialogue. Um, and there's this sort of somewhat lengthy discussion about trying to teach someone what is meant by the word walking. Right. right. So, you can you can see someone walking. You can point and say, "Oh, you know, this is this is what we mean by you know embolare uh, to to walk, right? You know, this is but what you're doing." There can be but, a little confusion though. Like, are they moving? Yeah. Are they like going yeah. in that direction? Right, right, right. Is, is it? Does that mean going away from me because I insulted you, or does that mean you know um, coming towards me? You right. You have to uh, contextualize it so much. Um, that it really does become pretty confusing. How do we know that this given sign refers to this specific action? And so you can point, but pointing alone is is not really enough, um, which just as a little aside is a big sticking point for uh, uh, Wittgenstein and his own discussion, philosophical investigations of ostensive definition. Um, but I mean, the, the point that... <laughs> 
It's very interesting that, that you know, 75, 80% of the dialogue is about how signs, we can use signs to learn things. And then there's a pivot where he says, well, actually only Christ can really teach us anything. Uh, it's, it's only the inward teacher. It's only by turning inward and being illuminated by by the divine light that you can actually know or understand anything. So it's, uh, it's a little curious. All right. So I figured maybe we could pivot a little bit and discuss another figure that's not quite contemporaneous with Augustine, but will become somewhat influential on the medieval period. Um, we've discussed him on the podcast before, uh, Boethius. Um, what what exactly would you say are Boethius's main contributions to semiotics? And, and in, or in particular, he, he thought a lot about like uh, the question of relation. That, that, that we find in Aristotle. What exactly is a relation? And he makes this distinction in his writings between relation secundum esse and relation secundum dicit. You know, what exactly is, is this distinction? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's probably a shame, right, now for, for many reasons that uh, Boethius died, not only uh, when he did, but how he did. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and maybe you talked about that on your other yes, <laughs> yes. episode. Um, but yeah, he he Boethius is is an interesting figure in this this translation of Greek figures into Latin. He was a great translator, I think, in a lot of ways. Not the best translator, but a very interesting and thoughtful one. Um, so he not only translated Aristotle's categories, but also commented on them. And he also did a, a translation and commentary of Porphyry's Isagoge, um, which is really, I think, what what germinates a lot of his own thinking in terms of the commentary, because Porphyry um, in, in the Isagoge uh, talks about, you know, we're putting off the really interesting questions here. We're not, we're, we're just, you know, sort of going through the text and we're putting off the really interesting questions. And I think mm-hmm. Boethius kind of catches on that and goes, oh, what, what, what are the really interesting questions? Uh, so he he wrote a four book commentary on the categories, um, and it's kind of interestingly structured. That he has you know the first uh, book is is on substance, and then the second book is on quantity and relation, uh, and then the third book is quality, and the the fourth book takes up all all the rest of them. Um, and so in the the second book, um, first of all, a moment of honesty, I've actually not read the whole commentary carefully. Um, that's why <laughs> it's only printed in the uh, Minyes Patrologia Latina. Um, and it's this, you know, you're reading this on these cramped PDFs, um, makes your eyes bleed a little bit, not enough sure. paragraph separation. Um, but from what I have read, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting distinctions that he makes in talking about relation and what relation really is. And when you read Aristotle's categories and you read, um, um it's, uh, the, the chapter on relation, it's the second longest chapter in the categories, um, only behind the chapter on, on substance, chapter five. And uh, Aristotle really spends most of it saying it's very dialectical. It's very, let me let me try and work it out. What is relation? Mostly saying what it isn't. <laughs> He's trying mm. to struggle. It's like, well, it doesn't seem to quite fit into to substance, right? And so when he really defines what relation is, he seems almost to define it more negatively than positively. It's more, okay, well, it relation can't be the things themselves which are related. It's something else. It's something other. And this is where Boethius adds what comes to be sort of the standard way in a lot of scholastic writing for referencing relation is to refer to it as ad aliquid towards something other right. um, uh, which is a sticking point as well with the word aliquid that it is some other what um, but so this is, leads him also to to introduce this distinction between the, the relativum secundum essay and the relativum secundum tici which are just enormously difficult terms to translate even within Latin to the point that by the time of <laughs> Uh, John uh, uh, Ponceau, uh, you know, some 12 centuries later almost, they're referencing it as transcendental relation to talk about the relative secundum dici. Right. Uh, later thinkers will use the term ontological relation to reference the relative secundum essay. Right. And the reason for these terms uh, is that the, the relativum secundum dici 
is, as Dealey puts it in his translation of Palm So, relation, or excuse me, uh, being according to the way in which it must be expressed in discourse, which is quite a mouthful. Right? <laughs> um, but the point there is that there's a lot of things that we encounter, there's a lot of things that we talk about that are intelligible to us only insofar as we know them through certain relations. Mm. So one of the classic examples of this, which is used throughout scholasticism, is the word head. When we talk about a head, well, a head is always a head of a body. If there's no body, it isn't really a head. So it has to be, whatever it is itself, it has to be in relation to a body. Um, even in a metaphorical sense, right? The head of the committee, well, you have to have the rest of the committee. You have to right. have the body of the committee to have a head of a committee. Um, so this this um, kind of relativity, the reason it comes to be called transcendental is this occurs across all the categories. Uh, anything which can be named in any of the other categories can be called a relative in this sense. So that already shows that fitting relation into the categories is quite difficult. Now, the other term, the relativum secundum esse, is used to express the way in which relation itself has existence. So mm -hmm. relation according to its own proper mode of existence, which is that ad aliquid, that being towards something. Okay. Not the being of one thing towards another, but the towardsness itself. I see. So help me out a little bit. Will that So is he making a distinction between the things that are related and the relation itself? So like I could talk about my, re my relationship to my mother, but maternity or affiliation would be the relation itself that obtains between myself and my mother would that be correct exactly exactly and so when we reference you as son and your mother as mother those terms are identifying substances precisely as relationally intelligible hmm. a son is a son of a mother and a mother is a mother of children and you have to have the other term in order for those designations to make sense i see but yes paternity filiation maternity um, you know, even things like, uh, um, lordship or, uh, something like the activity of teaching, right? These are relational terms that, um, signify how or the manner in which two individual substances are themselves related. So professor, student, teaching, right? uh, mother, son, maternity or mm -hmm. affiliation same relation looked at from from different uh, perspectives there there's an asymmetry in some of these relations right i see and if i may ask i mean how exactly does this distinction become helpful or maybe even influential to how later the being of science is, is understood in later thinkers maybe we'll get to that later on but just yeah lay, lay just some groundwork <laughs> Just to, to anticipate it a little bit, um, you know, we already sort of mentioned, right, that the the sign isn't the thing, it isn't the vehicle, but yeah. it's that relation between the vehicle, the object, and the recipient or interpretant of the, the vehicle. Uh, so the question becomes, well, what kind of relation is the sign relation? Is it a a relation secundum dici, or is it a relation secundum esse, or is it some combination? Well, what exactly is going on? So this mm. is a big part of, of what becomes, especially in, in Iberian scholasticism, a huge part of the discussion, but even earlier in, in the uh, other parts of the continent, right? Um, scholasticism starts to build up this question. I see. All right, then. Well, I figured maybe we could jump ahead a little bit in uh in in the history of uh uh well western philosophy and and maybe start to discuss um the 13th century and 14th century and, and in particular the thought of uh thomas aquinas on the issue of signs and and uh their activity because i i as i understand it um this question that augustine raises about uh signs what signs are it'll eventually become present in Peter Lombard's sentences, which everyone at the university comments on. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but 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 if I understand it, that's how 
Augustine's definition of sign becomes um, a question of debate in later figures. Yeah, and again, a lot of it, you know, has to do with with sacraments and understanding this tension of nature and and uh, what's instituted. You know, um, God as the author of nature. You know, is if if God institutes a sign, is it the same thing as God creating natural signs or something like that? Right. right. So yeah, a lot of discussion comes up in in the context of that, and a lot of this starts to involve relation as well. Um, you find very interestingly in the sentences commentary, you know, relation. It's it's um, frequently in the background, uh, but it's it shows up in interesting ways and in interesting places. And also, I mean, um, Augustine's influence becomes uh, in Aquinas, I think, quite notable in the De Veritate. Mm. Um, I mean, there's especially that question on the teacher, um, right. which is he's responding to De Magistro at least indirectly throughout the whole thing and quite directly in a number of, of particular passages. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, I mean, Augustine's influence is huge and Peter Lombard's influence is huge. And um, yeah, he, you know, the, the dialectical structure of working these things out, which is characteristic of scholasticism. Um, yeah, you start getting a lot of different uh, ideas which which emerge and interpretations which emerge Um which, frankly, you know, as much work as has been done on Aquinas and, and as much work has, has been done in recent years on Scotus, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, mm. There's so much depth in these medieval controversies and discussions. Right, um, right. And a lot of that, that context have, yeah. is lost on us, unfortunately. I mean, when they start using the terminology that they use or, or, the, or raise the questions in the specific way that they do, we have to kind of just realize, okay, we're not... 13th or 14th century scholastic figures we're just not going to fully understand what they're getting at right even that word res right, right. talk about res and reale they have different interpretations as to what reale means right um, and so yeah we're we are we are newborn babes in terms of uh, understanding the depth of their their discussions how closely does aquinas follow Augustine's definition with respect to the sign. Uh, I, I know that Dealey, I don't want to say he's unimpressed with Aquinas, but but he does note that there's something of, I think he calls it like a schizophrenia, <laughs> schizophrenia in Aquinas, where sometimes he's very faithful to Augustine's definition, but other times he, think, he thinks there's more to the being of signs than just what Augustine proposed. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, this is, you know, it's an issue that's well noted with Aquinas that um, with with sainted figures, he's very respectful and mm -hmm. he doesn't want to overturn the respect for the figure and overturning their language. Um, very seldom will he just explicitly flat out outright say, no, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, he does that, uh, you know, with, with Boethius, for that matter, too, on the definition of person. Um, right. Uh, so you can see in this, and, and I think especially in the um, um, De Veritate, um, I can't recall exactly what the uh, the questions are, but in questions 9 and 4, questions 4, 9, and 11 are the three main places in his De Veritate where he talks about sign. And you can see that there's just this this tension, right, mm. in how Aquinas is trying to interpret it and understand it, and how Augustine defines it. So you can see um, he uses, you know, the the definition of sign as Augustine proposes it. He doesn't propose his own or a new definition, but he um, he wants to talk about signs as dealing with the word right and the interior word especially the, the right. verbum mentis or verbum cordis which is not sensible right, right right it results in a sensible something that you can have a, a conventional linguistic sign which is a sign of this verbum mentis but if you're talking about the verbum mentis as a sign um, which he does not only in, in these texts, but also, I believe, somewhere in the census commentary, as well as in a, um, a quad liberal question. Yeah, you have to move beyond Augustine. And, right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, 
continual struggle to to really um distance himself from it without distancing himself from the the you know uh, well-praised well-loved doctor of the church that is augustine right right exactly and and one of the interesting things that that aquinas plays around with and i think you've alluded to it a bit is is that the being of signs is is better spoken of with respect to cognition rather than sensation or or, or, sen- or sensibility. And when he talks about how, I, I think at one point in the De Veritate, he talks about how angels think and cognize. He compares or even classifies uh, angelic concepts as signs among angels in a way that they communicate to each other, which I think is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, from from the De Veritate, I don't want to read the whole text, but there's. Um, a I have I have quotations passage. if you, if you want to use those, <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah. Well, and just to, to, to specifically on this point about angels, uh, and this is where Dealey says that there's a kind of schizophrenia in in Aquinas's treatment of the sign. Um, this is from De Veritate, Question Nine, Article Four, Response to the Fourth Objection, where he says that the and, and uh, you know what. What what the hey, I'll go ahead and read the whole thing. Sweet. Uh, he says that the word sign, properly speaking, cannot be said of something unless one cognitively proceeds from it to something other by a process of discursive reasoning. And according to this, signs are not in the angels, since their knowledge is not discursive, as was held in the preceding question. And accordingly, signs in our experience are sensible things because our cognition, which is discursive, arises from sensible things. And so here, from this part, we're squarely in the Augustinian tradition, and we're we're right there with Augustine. But then he goes on, commonly speaking, we are able to call a sign anything which by being grasped itself makes something else to be known. And according to this common way of speaking, an intelligible form is able to be called a sign of that which is grasped through it. Thus, the angels grasp things through signs, such that one angel speaks to another through a sign, namely through the specifying form, in which the understanding of one is rendered perfectly in ordination to another. Well, this is, and and this is Dilo's point, it kind of seems like Aquinas has flipped backwards the proprie loquendo, the properly speaking, and the communitaire, the commonly Mm. Um, it's like they're, they're because what he's talking about with commonly speaking really seems to identify the formal rationale of what a sign is whereas this properly speaking is identifying it strictly in our way of experiencing signs and our way of experiencing signs as animals right <laughs> And it's this struggle with this this trying to respect the Augustinian definition while recognizing that there's something more to what signs really are. Mm. That is very interesting. And and if I if I if I can ask, and maybe um I'm just grasping at nothing here, but with respect to identifying signs in in connecting them to with with cognition was this a move that was unique to aquinas or is this a, a move you might you might say that we find in later scholastic figures as well yeah it's it's pretty common um at the time to start thinking about cognition in terms of of signs and again a lot of this has to do with with aristotle and has to do with that de interpretatione test sure. right where he's talking about uh, words and concepts and things uh, are our semantic triangle um which uh, just very quickly what other point um to to emphasize that tension in aquinas and how he's dealing with this um in another question of the de veritate in question four uh article one response to objection seven he says that the uh, interior word possesses the rationale of signification more properly than does the exterior word. Right. Uh, the exterior word being something which is sensibly grasped, the interior word being something which is only grasped by the intellect and, and not sensible at all. Um, so there's just, you see this, you know, this is something, again, this comes from Aristotle, this comes from his discussion of concepts. Uh, it comes, 
not only from the De Interpretatione, but even though Aristotle himself does not explicitly link it there to uh, the De Anima, right? You know, those two texts, you put those in front of the scholastics and they go, hey, wait a second. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're talking about how the soul is in some manner all things. And, you know, here's these discussions of, in a very incipient manner of, of percepts and concepts in Aristotle's book three. And we're talking about concepts here in the De Interpretatione. It's it's not hard to bridge those two. It's a short, small gap. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of, of thinkers, uh, once they start getting these Aristotelian flux, uh, influx, um, start thinking about signification and concepts and cognition and how we really understand things. And yeah, mm -hmm. you throw in texts like the De Magistro of, of Augustine, you go, know, okay, well, now we got these different traditions and we have a dialogue that we can get into and we can right. dispute and debate with each other and we scholasticism got our, yeah we got our augustinians over here and our aristotelians over here and let's uh, let's have a fight till we figure this out right and then another interesting point that aquinas develops in his writing is his account of sensation and perception um this was something that john Dealey returns to i think the entire course of his career, at least in all of his writings, he's he's particularly interested in what sensation is. What does Aquinas understand sensation to be? Is is it something that's antecedent to forming sense images or phantasms? Because typically, when we think about like sensation in the modern period, not to generalize, but we typically think of like pictures in the mind, if that makes sense of that, that's what sensation consists in, but that's not quite what Aquinas is getting at when he talks about sensation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try and be kind of brief on this topic because there's, uh, you know, uh, this is an eight hour lecture, right? Here. Right. right. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's fine. And I think it's important because yeah, um, we have this, this kind of uh, uncritical appropriation of, particularly british empiricist thinking about sensation right that uh, there's impressions on the senses and that results in the formation of images or pictures or, or so, some sort of uh, representation in the mind um for aquinas it's it's in fact far more complicated and fascinatingly being borne out in contemporary neuroscience uh, in all sorts of really really interesting ways oh. um which uh I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if you've um, one of these days, maybe you know, sometime you can get Daniel DeHaan on your, your podcast to talk about it. Um, but at any rate, uh, just thinking about, you know, what's, what's going on in sensation, um, to give the 30,000 foot view of it for Aquinas, uh, it has to be discussed in terms of two different, what he calls immutations, which are, are changes affected by something from without, so there's the the physical or natural immutation, as he calls it, which is the literal physical impression on the sense organ of something by the sensible faculty. Um, which the the one uh, confusion there, I think, that he has is you know they didn't really quite understand the functioning of light at you know late 13th century. Mm. Um, so he thought that there was no natural immutation in sight. Um, that, that there was only what was called a spiritual or intentional immutation, which is what the sensation itself properly consists in as an activity of the soul. Um, that through these impressions, we have a relation to an object which is formed. Mm. And so it's, I always love to point this out. I mean, it's it's just such a fascinating topic to me that we're all undergoing at any given moment in time, a countless number of natural or physical immutations that aren't really resulting in our awareness of them as a perceived object. Right. So just there in terms of what's going on sensationally and sensationally, it's maybe the wrong word there, <laughs> sensitively and perceptually, uh, it's really hard to disentangle the two. You know, what's really sensation? What's perception? Do we ever have sensation without some sort of perception? What are the faculties that are really involved? How are we really relating to these objects? But right now, I can guarantee to all of your listeners, um, until I draw attention to it, you're probably not thinking about the 
feeling of your shirt on your left shoulder. Right. Or the temperature of the room. Right. Temperature of the room or that kind of, you know, vague in the background noise of maybe a motor or something or uh, your foot's on the floor or is there a smell in the air? Is there no smell in the air? Um, What are you tasting at the moment? You're always tasting something. Now, maybe like me, you know, your attention goes to that and you think, oh, my mouth tastes kind of bad. I want a mint. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm always, always, uh, I go through mints like nobody's business. Um, but yeah, that there's always that reception going on, but there's not always that attention correlative with it. Mm. And that attention is always directed not towards just your, your own sensation or representation, but towards the thing itself. Mm. that's what sensation is it's directing us towards the things themselves through the way in which they impress themselves upon us Uh, so for yeah aquinas there's this process of sense perceptual semiosis not that he calls it that but that's the nature of our animal contact with the world Uh, that things are being signified to us and very fascinatingly you know I mean, it's a concatenation of of semiotic sort of relations which occur in sensation. So we have our proper sensibles, which signify to us also common sensibles. Um, so proper sensible. Um, again, I don't want to go on too long here. Uh, we're already we're already over an hour or pushing an hour here. Um, but proper sensibles are those things which pertain to each individual sense faculty as distinctive of it. So color and light, uh, color being the differentiation of light, is the proper sensible of sight. Whereas, um, you know, odor is the proper sensible of smell, and a certain frequency of vibration is the proper sensible of hearing. Mm. But they can convey to us um, common sensibles, those things which can be perceived by a multitude of senses. So through light, I can perceive the extension of my desk. And as I knock my finger across it in motion, I can get a sense of the extension in hearing as well. Mm. Um, So one sensible is signifying another sensible. The proper signifies the common. And then together, the whole thing signifies more than that. It signifies these perceptual elements which require um, some further cognitive action, uh, which can then lead to intellectual uh, objects as well and so on and so forth aquinas then would then distinguish between sensation and perception i mean for, for perception it's a it's an awareness of the object in in, in question or maybe not awareness isn't the right word but... yeah well there's, there's a kind of evaluation that always goes on in perception um we're thinking about how things are are potentially beneficial or potentially harmful um and so, yeah, there's there's more going on there. So I figured maybe then we can move on from from Thomas Aquinas. Again, we could probably devote like whole episodes on 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 his understanding of uh, cognition. But uh, I figure we could maybe move on to discuss uh, these two Franciscan figures in the 13th and 14th century, uh, Roger Bacon and uh, John Dunn Scotus and their thoughts on signs and signification. Um and yeah, I figured maybe we could start with uh, Roger Bacon, uh, because as I understand it, he in particular devoted a, a work to discussing what signs are. And he does sort of, he, he sort of determines the trajectory of how people are going to understand signs, at least for, for, for a substantive period of time. Uh, so, so how exactly does Roger Bacon character, characterize signs or, or the sign relation? Yeah, I mean, Bacon's a he's an interesting figure, and the little work um, it's been translated and published in uh, not not terribly long ago um, by Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies, um, De Signos or or On Signs. Uh, it's just a it's a short little volume, and a lot of it is um, I've got it around here somewhere. I'm not sure, right? But I have too many books uh, hanging out on my 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 desk these That's days. That's a mood, um, but. Uh, Bacon, his, you know, he he talks about signs um, in a somewhat revolutionary way, because he departs from Augustine's definition. Uh, he he quite explicitly oh. says, 
this is wrong. <laughs> it's it's not this. It's broader than this. Uh, he says that that uh, he's you know re- rejecting Augustine's definition um, because he denies that it's something presented to sense. Uh, he denies that you know he's he's very much enamored by what Aristotle has to say. Uh, again, picking up from this De Interpretatione text. Um, he also takes up from the De Veritate again, um, this notion that, uh, the passiones anime, um, connecting this with the De Interpretatione, that the passions of the soul are signs. Well, well, those clearly aren't presented to sense. And so they have to be, uh, you know, recognized as, as, uh, something which signifies, which are not themselves uh grasped as as objects mm. um what would then you know sort of taking up from um it, it takes a couple of centuries to really get this this terminology but will be called instrumental signs later on right um that this is what this is only one category of signs and augustine has confused the, the part for the whole mm. and so this is really august uh, bacon's major contribution roger bacon's major contribution um <clears throat> Yeah, he doesn't even give us really a, a great definition, but he says that it stands in the category of relation mm. and is spoken of essentially with respect to the interpreter to which it signifies. Right. So in some way, I mean, this is, I, I think, a genuine advance, right? He really does, um, I mean, he, he explicitly connects the notion of sign and relation. He says that, okay, well, whatever a sign is, it has to do with with relation, there's a question, though, about whether this placing it in the category of relation is right. the right thing to do. Right? Does it fit into what a relation is, categorically speaking? Uh, and this is a point that will be a controversy for centuries going forward. You know, mm. what, what exactly is the relation between signs and relation? And I think what's really important and what's really detrimental to Bacon's theory of sign, what really makes it problematic, is that he um, says that the relationship between the sign, by which he, he means the vehicle, is only incidentally referred to the significant or the object that it's essentially related to the interpreter. Mm-hmm. And so it's very interesting. I mean, he notes this point that there's this third element, right? That not only is there the sign and the signified, but the interpreter. But he says it's essentially related to the interpreter and only incidentally related to the signified. And boy, does that just kick the door wide open for nominalism if you accept right. that approach. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you, you see that this notion, right, is not... Um, it's not entirely unique, right, to recognize the relationship to the interpreter. Um, Bonaventure, for instance, has has a discussion of this as well. Mm-hmm. But for, for Bonaventure, it's the other way around, right? The relationship between the signified, uh, the signifier and the signified, the vehicle and the object is essential, whereas the relation to the interpreter is incidental. Mm. Bacon's, you know, yeah, both both Franciscans, but go in different <laughs> different directions here, right? Right. Uh, with how they want to treat that, oh. um, but yeah, I, I mean, just quite generally, um, this association of signs and relations um, that that Bacon makes very explicit. Um, I, I do think this was just it was in the air, it was in the atmosphere, it was in the university. This was a discussion that was being had. Mm. Um, again, that influence of Aristotle, quite, quite large, um, you know, between the, the works of the Organon and the De Anima. Um, so that not only the, the De Interpretatione, but also the categories, everyone's reading these things and thinking about it and drawing these, these relations together. Um, especially as they're trying to understand just what thoughts are. Mm, um, mm. And that that uh, quintessential sort of you know dispute of scholasticism between the Platonic and the Aristotelian, uh, a lot of which hinges on understanding thoughts and thinking and and cognition. Right. Um, so as you're trying to resolve these issues, you're gonna get into these questions about signs. I think. Right. Exactly. And then another interesting Franciscan figure that 
while he also becomes influential on how later figures understand the the being and activity of science, he becomes influential even beyond the medieval period and and really has an impact on early semiotic figures, modernity and post-modernity, like Peirce. Like I, as I understand it, uh, Scotus was 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 uh, Peirce's uh, favorite scholastic figure, if if I understand it correctly. Yeah, he read Scotus quite extensively. Um, however, it's always important to note that um, critical scholarship on the works of Scotus was a little bit late to the game. Sure. Uh, the the Vatican Commission um, appointed to do the critical works of, of uh, Scotus, I think, only began or really undertook their work uh, in the 1950s. Okay. Um, so, you know, by contrast, we've got a, a 130 years of Thomist uh, scholarship, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, exactly, you know, and and only about 70 years of, of Scotus, and fewer people working on it with Scotus, um, mm. just in general. Um, so Peirce uh, had the um, Luke Wadding edition of Scotus's works, um, published by Ludovico Vives in the 19th century. Um, which, you know, a wonderful thing that, that the Ludovico Vives uh, publishing house did with all of the editions that they produced, uh, in, including the works of John Ponceau. Uh, but the critical scholarship was severely lacking, sure. uh, such to the, that the first several volumes of the Vives edition of Scotus's Opera Omnia included about 50% spurious works. Um, I the, see. the later volumes are are more correct. There's a few occasional spurious uh, editions in there. Uh, but the majority of, of, of the, not the majority, but about half the, the, um, the first several volumes are right. questionable at best. Um, so some of the influence there, uh, for instance, uh, Thomas von Erfurt, um, right. the turn of the 13th, 14th century Modiste, um, actually has the first work in <laughs> the Wadding edition of the Scotus Upper Omnia, uh, the, the Grammatica Speculativa, or the De Modo Significandi, um, which was quite influential on uh, Peirce's, not just thinking, but even just his his nomenclature. So talk about a speculative grammar. Uh, right. He was very enamored of that idea. Um, just quite... Uh, not purely coincidentally, because there's nothing purely coincidental in intellectual traditions, but also very influential on the thought of Martin Heidegger, whose uh, second half of his habilitation shrift was on the De Modus Significanti, uh, which he thought to still at the time to be the work of Scotus. So mm. uh, that was only definitively proven not to be the work of Scotus in 1922. So okay, um, uh, Martin Grabman. Uh, but at any rate, uh, to get back to, to Scotus himself, I mean, uh, frankly, I you know just uh, cards on the table here. I'm not at all a Scotus scholar. Um, I find reading Scotus is like um, pulling teeth and I don't know setting fire to the nerve endings that are uh, sticking out of your mouth. Then um, right. just uh, <laughs> he's he's a bit of a torture to read. I find, um, but fascinating, fascinating thinker. Definitely deserves a lot more of of our attention. Uh, and I'll actually specifically on the question of signification. Uh, point out the work of uh, Paniel Reyes Cardenas, uh, who's been doing a lot of work on particularly the connection of Peirce and, and Scotus. But um, I think he's got uh, a new book on Scotus that just came out um, and has done a lot of work, a lot of research. And there's a great YouTube talk that maybe we can include in, in the links um, sure. that he gives on, on Scotus's contribution. Um, but really, the I mean, the the there's not an explicit treatise on signs or anything in Scotus. It's it's much like you know, with the work of Aquinas, the insights are distributed. The philosophical insights are distributed throughout the corpus. Um, that we we really need uh, an an index Scotisticus uh, to go with the index Domesticus to really uh, find how how he thought about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it's tied up with the discussion of universals. Um, you know, well, what really is universal? How is it thought of, considered, and understood? Um, so I don't know, to be frank, if there's a definition of sign anywhere in Scotus. Um, mm. There may well be. Uh, I know he talks a good bit about signification. Um, oh, and I know okay. there's actually, there's a good article in all things on, uh, I think it was in something like Nietzsche studies on <laughs> Scotus on signification uh, from the early 90s by Dominic Perler. 
um, that we can maybe provide a link to that as well, because he mm. gives a good critical analysis of, of what SCOTUS has to say about the signification. Um, so when I can't speak to something myself, I want to uh, punt it away to, to <laughs> more experts. That's fair. That's fair. Um, but yeah, I, you know, again, a, a lot of the the discussion um, comes from the Perry Harmonious text of Aristotle. You know, mm. how is this changing how we understand words and the signification of words? And um, the one thing that I I, I do uh, know is that Scotus is instrumental in affecting the realization that the signification of words and concepts is always to things. I mean, Aquinas makes this point as well. Uh, in Aquinas, um, it's a little bit more explicit, the intermediary role of the interior word or the concept. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of complexity in Aquinas' own discussion of what a concept is and how it's formed. And I think there's there's texts which are just, they're quite unclear in Aquinas. Yeah, and I I think it's understandable, if inexcusable, that a number of Thomist scholars um, take Aquinas at times to be presenting something like a little bit of a representationalism in his theory of the interior word. Mm. Um, because if you just read certain texts out of context, you're kind of going like to be confused. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, so understandable, but inexcusable, because uh, we do have all these resources to understand the work of Thomas and, and look through his texts to mm. see what he really says. But with Scotus, um, he does seem to change his opinion over time, I believe, from early works to later ones, or to at least clarify his position. But he is consistent in holding that words, spoken words, are really ultimately signs of of things. They might be remote effects by the immediacy of some intelligible specification, mm. uh, but they are really, I mean, they, they have their essence of that signification from the things themselves, which that theory alone uh, explains to me how someone could confuse the Grammatica Speculativa of Erfurt for the work of, of Scotus, because that is the modiste's central point, is that the there are the three modes, of the mode of being, the mode of understanding, and the mode of signification, and these modes have a formal sameness across their three modal variations. Mm. So the modus ascendi is what gives the form essentially to the modus significandi. 